Sequel Bits 2020 Virtual Event, Rob Sewell, Jupyter Notebooks, Take 4322. Welcome to Sequel Bits, virtually. It's in London, but it's not. You're all coming to join us for a great event, but we're all sat at screens. I know it's, it's all a bit weird, but hopefully you're enjoying it. I'm wearing my orange shirt because it's how I feel comfortable in sequel bits, running around and helping people. My name's Rob. I live in the UK, in a beautiful part of the UK, in the Southwest. But you're not here to look at pictures of England. You're here to learn about Jupyter Notebooks for DBAs. Here's the slide where I will talk about, this is me and this is what I do. I'm a consultant. I'm lucky enough to have been awarded uh, MVP. But most important on that slide is my contact details. At SQL DBA with Beard. On Twitter. Please, if you have any questions, use that. Come and find me. Ask me a question. I'll be more than happy to help you. We're going to talk about Jupiter. This is the South Pole of Jupiter, taken on a flyby by a space scoop. But we're going to talk about this Jupiter instead, with a Y. The name comes from the planet. And because it's traditional, part of science. It includes the languages that make up the core programming for the notebooks themselves. But most of all, Galileo was the first person who discovered the moons of Jupiter. And when he did so, he presented his uh, results, including the data. So other people could make use of that data and see if they could reproduce the same results. And that's very much where notebooks came from. Okay, Rob, what's a notebook? What's a Jupyter notebook? Well, originally people like Terry and Simon here, data scientists, they were the first people who used notebooks. They used Python and R and Spark to build models to predict results to help businesses take better decisions on their data. But I'm a DBA. What's good is there for me? Let's travel back in time a moment. I want to talk about running queries. Because I think this will help us to understand what, for me, is the best reason for using Jupyter Notebooks as a DBA. Many years ago, when my beard wasn't so grey, we used to query our SQL databases using these tools. We could connect to Northwind and run demonstrations. For two and a half decades, we've used the same mythology for querying our databases. And there's been a problem. You see, even in PowerShell, I love PowerShell, all the versions of PowerShell, we have the same issue. I've pointed it out for you here. In Management Studio, the same problem. Even Azure Data Studio, we still have this problem. Let's make it bigger. Here it is, this big cross. Now, imagine that it's three o'clock in the morning and you've been called out because of major P1 super important issue with your application that makes your company the most money. And whilst you've been called out, you've opened up Azure Data Studio or Management Studio or PowerShell, and you've done some analysis on the system. 
Maybe you've run a query against a database or against some DMVs and you've got back some results. And from those results, you've decided what I'm going to do is I'm going to take this particular action. And in taking that action, you've then successfully resolved the incident and gone back to bed. The next morning, at half past eight, you've come into the office. That, okay, these days, you've joined a Teams meeting and you've had a wash up. How did this incident happen? When were we alerted? What could we have done to learn about this incident earlier, to stop it from happening, to reduce the impact on our customers? You go through and understand all of these questions and how to resolve them. And you say, I ran the query and this result was 5,720. So I did this thing and fixed it. And one of your colleagues says, oh, hang on a minute, if it was 5,620, wouldn't we have been seeing this and this as well? Are you sure? And you go, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Let me just open up management studio. Oh no, I've closed it. You see, the problem here is that while you had those results when you were making that decision at three o'clock in the morning, when you hit the cross, they were just gone, completely gone. There's no way for you to get back in time and reproduce those results. Sure. You could have taken a screenshot. You could have saved them to an Excel file. There are transcripts you could use with PowerShell and other methods that you could have used. But straight up front, without any effort, just using the tooling you like to use to query your databases, the results have gone. I'm a DBA. being on call, responding to incidents, these were all things that I used to do. And having to ensure that I recorded my actions and the results I got meant some extra things I needed to do at three o'clock in the morning. Sometimes I got it wrong. Sometimes I forgot to paste that screenshot because I was on to the next one. Sometimes I didn't quite copy all of the results. Notebooks enable you to forget all about them. And that for me is the number one biggest reason why kittens shouldn't be allowed in the office when you're doing a recording. But also why DBAs should use Jupyter Notebooks. So what's the Jupyter Notebook? Well, it's easy. It's a document that contains text, executable code, images, and the query results. So what's our Azure Data Studio? It's a cross-platform desktop that enables us to interact with our SQL servers. So it's only for Azure? No. Just naming it Azure means that it's cool. Microsoft thinks it's a great thing. It will, of course, interact with all your Azure data offerings, but it'll also connect to all of your on-premises SQL servers. All the supported ones will have all the full functionality. And if you're just querying with T-SQL, you can go way back. Oh, it looks just like Visual Studio Code, Rob. Yep, it does. And there's a really good reason for that. You can see Azure Data Studio on that side and Visual Studio Code on that side. They're based on the same code base. It's literally the same code underneath. Why have we got Azure Data Studio? Because it enables extra overlays that we can put in place to have pretty colors for data people, to show more information about our instances.
I think that's good enough for slides. And I think we'd rather have some demos. So let's go and have a look at what Azure Data Studio looks like and what a Jupyter Notebook is. So this is Azure Data Studio. But perhaps it's more relevant to show you this first. This is the Management Studio user voice. And as you can see, the number one request is for a dark theme for SQL Server Management Studio. And that enables me to show you how to use and interact with Azure Data Studio. So as you can see, color themes are easy in Azure Data Studio. This is the default, one of the default dark themes. To access anything within Azure Data Studio, to make a change, use the command palette. And you can access this by pressing Control and Shift and P, or Command and Shift and P if you're on a Mac. I also like to use F1. And I can start typing in the top and the results will begin to filter for me. Color theme is highlighted. So I'm gonna press enter. And now we can see the choice of themes that I have installed. And as you move over, they're all preview. So if you wish, you could work in red. You could have a solarized version. But a wise man told me that we should always do our demonstrations in light mode. So I'm gonna to change to quiet light for my cover thing. This is Azure Data Studio. If we click on this top connections block, you can see we have something that looks a bit like a registered servers list. And if I was to right click on one of these and click manage, you can see some of the additional overlays that are available to us in Azure Data Studio, the functionality that's not capable in Visual Studio Code. So we've got our server overview giving us some information and some charts. We could look at our databases. Perhaps if we wanted to actually look at a database, we can see the tables. There's some interactions we can do. We can create notebooks from here. If I want to create a new notebook, I can open Azure Data Studio at three o'clock in the morning. I'm responding to an incident. I press F1 and I can start typing new and it'll come up with new notebook. Comes up at the top on my screen because more frequently used commands will rise to the top in the results. It also shows you the shortcut keys that you could use. So Alt and Windows and N on my Windows machine. I press new notebook and now I have created a notebook and this notebook is running a SQL kernel. Within Azure Data Studio we have SQL, PySpark, Spark Scala, Spark R, Python 3, PowerShell kernels available to us. We can use one of those within our notebook in Azure Data Studio. So the next thing that I'm going to do three o'clock in the morning is I'm going to click on this text button here. And that's gonna add on a text cell, which will enable me to write some markdown. And when I start writing my markdown on the left, I get an instant preview of what I'm typing on the right-hand side. So what was the problem? Question mark. And you know, probably when I'm responding at three o'clock in the morning, I'm going to make some typos, but I can go back and fix those later. So say I, I was responding to uh, oops, an incident, 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 um, and I ran this query. 
kind of described what the problem was, maybe put a ticket number in there. And then I would have put a code block. Now, when I've added this code block, it's ended up at the top. But these two arrows here enable me to move the cell around, I can move it up and down. And now I can write my query. This is a SQL notebook, so I'm just going to write select that server name. I'll show you something else. This notebook can be connected to a SQL instance. If I choose select connection here, it confusingly gives me change connection as the available thing to press. And now I can go from my uh, registered servers ish and pick an instance and I can connect to it. The advantage of connecting to my instance straight away is it means that as I start typing, I start getting IntelliSense for the language that I'm using. So I've got select add at server name. And then I press play, and now I've got my results. So maybe I'll just say as SQL bits. Here we go. We've got our results. Now, I quite often do this when I am asked to look at an issue. Luckily, these days I don't get called out at three o'clock in the morning because I don't work in as a production DBA anymore. But when somebody says, hey Rob, this is not working, can you just have a look? I'll crack open a notebook and I'll just start typing. Maybe I'll use it again, maybe I won't. But at least I've got a record of what it is that I've done. I've got my thought process in the text blocks and I've got the queries that I've run in the code blocks. And I've got the results down below. Oh yeah, prove it. Okay, so we'll do control and S and we'll save this. I'm going to save it in the temp folder because why not save it in the temp folder? And we'll call it 2020 SQL bits. Now, Let's go back to our story. Let's pretend it's three o'clock in the morning. I've finished my resolution of this instant and I've just pressed close. It's gone. If I reopen Azure Data Studio, there is my notebook. The one that I just saved is there ready for me. If that had been Management Studio, I wouldn't have had my results. So, how are these results being stored? If I press Control and single quote, I'm going to open up the terminal within Azure Data Studio. And then I'm going to use the PowerShell command get content, basically read me the file, c slash temp slash. 2020 SQL bits. Notebooks are saved with an IP YMB extension. So this is my notebook from above. And as we can see, it's just JSON. So we can see at the top that it was a SQL notebook. We can see our markdown. So these are the things that I wrote. So there's the SQL bits. What was the problem? I was responding to an instant when, when. And then we can see the code. So here is the code that I wrote. This is the exact code that I wrote. And sure enough, you can see how long it took to run and you can see the results. So there's my column name. SQL bits, and there's the data they had. First row was just the name of the container, because this one is a container. So it's very important to remember that if your queries that you run here are queries that are going to contain sensitive data, then your notebook is going to store those queries as text in a JSON file. 
The other point to remember is that if your query brings back a gigabyte of data, your notebook is going to be a gigabyte of data in size and more because it's going to put all of that data into the JSON file. So two things that you probably want to, to realize. The other point here is that nowhere in that JSON does it tell me the date or the time that I ran the query or which user I was connected as. So when you start off a notebook, you might want to just get the date, get the username, put those in as results so that it's obvious that, yeah, I ran this as my administration account. This was run at three o'clock in the morning. So you're getting those sort of results available to you. That's to me, number one reason for having Jupyter Notebooks as a DBA. What else can we do with Jupyter Notebooks? As a DBA, I often use runbooks because I'm doing the same thing repeatedly. I have some notebooks in my GitHub repository. And if we go and have a look at the ones in the agent folder, I've got one that's called getting the runtime web page. So this was created because we had an ETL process that had many jobs that were doing various things and no way of viewing when these jobs were running or how long they were taking. We needed to add new jobs in. We needed a gap in the schedule to be able to fit these jobs in. We also had an overrunning job that was impacting other jobs that, that were following on because they were scheduled. This is a PowerShell notebook. PowerShell notebooks are always going to attach to local host. That's where they're going to go. Now, Azure Data Studio PowerShell notebooks are going to use the PowerShell version that is embedded within the PowerShell package. Because a Jupyter notebook is running inside Python. And when we choose a PowerShell kernel, what we're actually doing is saying, take the code in these code blocks, pass it through this package to the PowerShell executable, run it, and then bring the results back and put them in the notebook for me, please. On a Windows machine, that's going to use Windows PowerShell 5.1. On a non-Windows machine, it's going to use PowerShell Core. Now, for most people in most scenarios, that's going to give you the same results. But there are differences between the two that might just catch you out if you're trying to run things between that, that need to run cross-platform. So we've got a notebook. And <clears throat> having written this notebook, I could then give it to any member of the team. So it normally got passed down towards the first support, first line support people. And, and they were the ones that were able to see what happened at that point in time. We put some instructions. What we need to do is to put the instance in single quotes and we need to choose how many days back. Requires the DBA tools and a C temp folder. And then there's this block to run, and it just says run this cell to check the prerequisites. And compress play. And it says, yes, you've got the DBA tools module. PowerShell Gallery is trusted in case I needed to install it. The code is actually a little bit more than that. But our users don't need to so see that. So we can collapse it, and only the first line is shown. Really useful if you want to build big, long T-SQL queries or PowerShell commands and just say to your user, just press this play button. Unfortunately, you can either have one line, the first line of code in view, or all of the code. And as we saw here, we need to choose two things to be able to change. So we're going to change our instance and we're going to change the days behind how many days back am i going to need this information about 
And then I'm gonna press play. And this is gonna get the agent job run times for this instance for 24 hours starting from one day ago. And it's gonna open up behind the scenes a web page. And as you can see, this web page has got job history timeline for our instance name. This one's a container, but it would say your instance name. The file name is titled with the date and also the day because that was important for us and the instance name. And it's gonna show which jobs ran, whether they succeeded or failed and how long they took to run in a nice timeline view. So we could see maybe that, you know, between this is important and, and this is also important, we've, we've got a little bit of time here where we could perhaps fit in another ETL job. It's a really useful way of enabling a notebook to be run by anybody and provide them with great results. So that's a really useful thing that we can use a notebook for to enable us to rerun a uh, thing that we do. And you can do the same sort of thing, but actually um, use it for giving to other people as well. So we had a, uh, a requirement where we needed to provide which users were accessing which types of data. And this was something that was frequently done by the DBA team. So we created a notebook using DBA tools and import Excel to automatically create a color coded Excel workbook with these details in. And we enabled the people in the role that interface between the business and the technical teams to be able to run this at will. And this reduced the time that it took for the business to get the information, but also reduced the impact on the DBA team and made it much simpler for that interface role as well. We simply gave them this notebook. Comes up, press play. So we press play and make sure that we have all the modules that we've got. So we have our modules already, so we can carry on. This block of code just makes sure that our output doesn't get truncated within our notebook. And it says if you want all the permissions on one worksheet, just use this code. You can get further code below, which will loop through a variety of instances. And we've got a directory where we're going to save our Excel. We've got the SQL instance that we're going to connect to. Because this is a container and I'm using SQL auth, I've just used the secret management module to make it a little easier for me and default parameters. And I just press play. And what it's gonna do is gonna to go to the instance, it's gonna get all of those permissions details and it's gonna write them to a workbook. It only takes a few seconds to run and then it opens up our Excel sheet. It says this worksheet shows the user permissions for each database on instance name and the dates that it was run and a little uh, information about what's color coded how. And then we can look at our permissions and we've got all of our workbook permissions as deep as we want to go. So if we wanted to have a look and see who are our sysadmins, we can see Andre Kaman is a sysadmin, Chrissy Lemaire is a sysadmin. So it's Father Jack and Jan Luca and John Martin and others. But maybe we wanted to look at the permissions on a database. So we can filter on the objects if I click the right thing. And uh, there we can see that we haven't got any uh, additional permissions on there. But if we'd added users with permissions, then we could have filtered by those there. Really simple, saved a lot of time, really useful. And you're thinking, oh, this is great, Rob. You've got all of these notebooks. How do I get these notebooks? If you want these exact notebooks, all you need to do is go to your browser and type in 
github.com slash SQL DBA with a beard and press enter. That's going to bring you to the front page of my GitHub repository. And you're going to see there that there's a pinned uh, repository called Jupyter Notebooks. And you click on that, it's going to go to Notebooks. And there are two types of notebooks. There's .NET notebooks that use .NET Interactive, which enable you to run uh, .NET Core PowerShell, PowerShell 7, uh, C Sharp and F Sharp, but not T SQL at the moment. The ones that we have at the moment in ADS are not .NET in my terminology. So we're going to click on that directory and we're going to click on that one was in the audit folder. And here it says instant permissions to Excel. If we click that, then you can see something else cool. So our notebook is rendered in GitHub completely. So you can see the text that we've written, the code that we can run, the results that we had when this notebook was saved. And this enables you to do another thing. If somebody asks you, why does this PowerShell not work in this way? Why am I getting this result with T-SQL? How do I make sure I can do this thing? If you create a notebook and run the code, not only can they use that notebook to run code on their own machine in their own environment to see what results they get, but it just in a browser, they can quickly see some information maybe that you've given, the code that you've run, the results you got. Oh yes, then I decided, you know, you should do it like this. Then you get the right sort of results. It's another really great way of sharing information using notebooks. Of course, you can't run the notebook in the browser as such, but they could download it and they could run it against their own machine. So how about another use case? We have a large number of instances and we make changes to our agent jobs. We might want to know when they were changed or who made a change, what change was made to them. Sometimes we might want to be able to undo that change and go back. And that's where source control is really useful. So one thing you can do is you can make sure that you run a DBA tools command to export your agent jobs into source control, just the T-SQL creation statements. And what we put into place for uh, one of the clients was a notebook to enable that. It's called exporting to source control. Now you can put this into an agent job and make it run automatically, but there were reasons why that wasn't possible in this scenario. So what would happen is we would make a change to an agent job. Let's do that. I was going to show you in um, Azure Data Studio, but unfortunately it didn't quite work. It didn't take the changes for some reason. I do need to investigate that. So we're just going to use Management Studio. And we're going to pick this job and we're just going to add a new step. So I'm going to call this new step. Uh, I think we'll call it SQL bits new step. And we'll just use my favorite demo T-SQL, select server name. And we'll say, okay. And we'll take these defaults. Yeah, that's fine. So we've made a change to our agent job. So we've made our change and now we can just make it in, we can just export the jobs into source control. And one of the problems that we've got with a PowerShell package running inside Python from a notebook is the session inside that package doesn't know where the notebook is. So this notebook is sat at D1 drive documents, GitHub, Jupyter notebooks, notebooks, and dot, not their agent, blah, blah, blah. But if we run PWD, that's present working directory, you can see that that session thinks it's at D1 drive. So for this scenario, we're just going to make sure that 
we put in some information, change this to your local path, and then we're just going to change to that directory and grab our source control status. And our working tree is clean, so we don't actually need to do a pull. There's no remote changes. So put in some information about if there are some any errors. And then we can make sure we're on the correct branch, but we already know that we're on our SQL bits branch anyway. And now we can run some PowerShell. And this time, instead of embedding the PowerShell in a notebook, we're going to call a uh, PowerShell script file that's in the same repository, it's sat here. And that's going to load as our function because it saves having all the complicated PowerShell code within this notebook. Now what we're going to do, I'm just going to press play while this goes, is we're going to choose a path for our agent jobs to get exported to. And then we're going to grab a list of uh, SQL instances, just the ones that are running on my beard nook. And then we're going to export the agent jobs through to T-SQL and make sure that we capture all of the changes. If we look in our folder of our SQL agent exports, you can see we've got a directory for each one of our instances. And if we were to pick an instance and a job, you can see all it is is the T-SQL job. And you can see we're getting our changes, what our last commit was. And whilst this was running, normally took about a minute, but today seems to take a little bit longer. So I'm just going to pause for a second. Okay, what we can see here is that we've got our results now, and it's telling us which agent jobs we've exported, how long it took to, to run each step. And in our source control tab, we've got one change. And it's for SQL 2017, N5, and it's, look, it's a new job step. And by clicking on the change, we can see what's been added. There we go. SQL bits, new step. And there's the code, well, there isn't the code that we've changed, but you can see how that can work. So now we can say, you know, add a new step. Oh no, we don't do that. Why did we make this change? to show source control for agent jobs, also jobs. Press control and enter, stage our change, and we can commit our change. Now our change is saved into source control and our agent jobs we know are safe. And if we wish to go back, we have the history, especially using something like Git lens. With Git lens, we could open up that particular agent job. Uh, it was this one. And we can see our file history. It wasn't that one, is it? It was this one. There we go. And we'll be able to see our file history. So we can see. There we go, that we made a change to show source control changes, and we can see what that change was. And if we wanted to, we could revert that change and return back to our original source control. So I briefly mentioned .NET interactive notebooks. And I'll show you how you can get them. Go to your browser of choice and type in dot net interactive notebooks. Search your favorite search engine and you'll see a blog post called dot net interactive is here. And it's by Maria from the dot net team. And it's gonna give you a list of instructions of how to get dot net onto your um, machine few steps to take, take you about 10 minutes. I'm not going to bore you with the details. You can follow those instructions, but follow them carefully and precisely. 
And once you do that, you can open up your uh, Azure Data Studio and we'll close this notebook. And if we have a new notebook, F1, new notebook, you can see that we can change the language that we're using, the kernel in notebook terms. And there we can see we've got .NET, oh, we don't have that. There are two things we need to do to make sure we can see .NET kernels in our notebook. First, we need to go to settings by clicking the cog and then finding settings and search for kernel. And you will find that this setting, notebook show all kernels will not be ticked. So you can tick that preview version, show all kernels. And then once you've done that, you just need to change the kernel to a different language. And once it's changed, you can then change it to one of the .NET languages. You can see we've got C Sharp, F Sharp, PowerShell. Again, this PowerShell is going to be running PowerShell 7, PowerShell Core. It's going to run the same cross-platform. One of the cool things about .NET Interactive Notebooks is that you can use two languages or three languages in the same notebook. So we can run C Sharp and PowerShell Core in the same notebook. You can even not spell the same correctly. Let's change that. One thing we could do is all notebooks, we have a button that says run all. I'm going to press run all. Now, you can find that your notebooks won't run if you have uh, in the region of 50, 70, 80 code blocks in a SQL notebook. And in fact, if you run your notebooks as agent jobs, then they just will fail and fall over. But for this one, it works perfectly fine. And what we've done is we've created 10,000 files in a temporary directory, started a stopwatch. We've then used C Sharp with this magic code, hash, exclamation mark, C sharp, we'll run some C sharp. I don't write much C sharp, but it's okay. And tells us that the number of files, 10,001. And then we're gonna count the same number of files with PowerShell core, it says, yep, the file count is 10,001. And we write a quick function in PowerShell, which one was quicker? And this one says, well, PowerShell core did it in 212 milliseconds, C which was quicker than C sharp, which did it in 710 milliseconds. And what I found is the first time I run this notebook, C sharp is always slower. But if we run it again, we'll probably find that, well, PowerShell core still did it quicker. We run it again, we can see that this time PowerShell core still did it quicker. Excellent, I've never had it happen three times in a row. Ah, <laughs> oh, no, it's gonna stay being PowerShell core quicker. Normally we get C Sharp coming out quicker after a while. There we go. C Sharp did it in 119 milliseconds. So it's just slightly quicker. No, nope, PowerShell did it quicker again. But you can see, we can keep on running our notebook again and again and getting the results. The other thing we can do is we could use C Sharp to set ourselves a variable called file underscore count as an environment variable. And then in PowerShell Core, we can actually read that variable back out. So it's really useful. You've got two different people with different skill sets and they can do one thing in C Sharp and you want to do something else in PowerShell, you can mix and match those things together. So that's .NET interactive notebooks, very, very, very small introduction to those. So to round up, hopefully you've learned that notebooks are really cool, that you can store them in source control, you can view them in GitHub, you can use them to write run books to demonstrate your open source module, your new thing for work, your system to clients. 
You can also use them as a way of recording the work that you're doing, maybe when you're called out at three o'clock in the morning. And that you've got .NET interactive notebooks, and those you can use different languages, and they're going to use PowerShell Core. There's so much more to learn about Jupyter Notebooks, but your only limit is your imagination. And I think as a DBA, you definitely should be looking into Jupyter Notebooks. If you wish to ask me any questions, please get in touch with me on Twitter. My name's Rob, and you can find me as SQL DBA with Beard on Twitter. Thank you very much.